So we've got every major brokerage firm represented here. Uh, we've got some of the most innovative technology firms represented here. Uh, one of the first questions we'll start with is, well, how are you, uh, as leaders within your organization, driving technology and adoption into such a large org? Yeah, so, so uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about is um, the sort of uh, global digital strategy that we have at CB Area that is kind of a, a guiding point for what kinds of things we look for externally as well as how we innovate internally. So uh, being involved with that has been uh, uh, very interesting over the last couple of years. And then um, also, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, our uh, external sort of scan function, day-to-day, uh, -day, many, many conversations every day with um, uh, companies that are specifically focused in our sector helps us to kind of get calibrated on what's coming up next, and that's another innovation-oriented thing. So. Cool. Yeah. Let's go down the line. So uh, the, the way we kind of look at technology at Cushion Wakefield, to put it simplistically, is uh, in three buckets. There's foundational, uh, which are many of the things that I think all of us uh, incorporate into our daily business of, of, of larger firms, and that's helping our, our brokers and our fee earners and all of our service lines make sure that they're solutioning for clients. So that could be I could come in many different ways. Um, one, one, one thing to think about that would be um, a CRM system, so relatively foundational. Uh, another bucket would be Frontier, something that's a little bit out there but is still used probably on a daily basis. Primarily we're partnership based, uh, so we, we, we don't have a fund, we don't view ourselves as a VC fund. We do invest but primarily through partnerships. So think of that as something in the realm of there would be some robotics and some of our asset services, cleaning services within airports, um, something a little bit more technology kind of advanced. And then kind of far future, um, we do, uh, again, partnerships um, uh, through Metaprop, through some universities. We just announced a, a big um, announcement with Stanford University. And so that's kind of looking around the corner what's next. So I think the last, the last panel probably hit on quite a bit of that. Um, and they spoke far more eloquently than I would. So I'll leave it to them to describe blockchain. Um, so I'm really fired up about how we're approaching technology at this point. So it has taken us a while. It's been a journey. And I think we're fortunate just being in the Bay Area that we start to see things a little bit in advance of, of some of the other geographies. But we're now at a point where we are clearly bought in as an organization that we are ultimately going to be a technology company in the real estate services industry. And so for us, what, what happens, and there are different ways to organize yourselves, as, as uh, these two have, have outlined. For us, there are kind of three key pillars to this. Pierce, it's, um, first is leadership. So we have from the very top down this strong belief that technology is going to lead the way and, and create the path for us over the next um, six months to five years to, to beyond. So we've got total leadership buy-in. Second piece is the investment. So we, we are now at a point where we are committed. And at JLL, we spend ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars in technology. It comes in different, different forms. But we've got the investment. So we've got leadership. We've got investment. And then we have structured ourselves. So the third piece of this is we've really structured ourselves to be able to address this. So within the framework of what is a 80 plus thousand person company and a publicly traded company that you have to continue to manage quarter to quarter so you're keeping the trains running. We found some creative ways to structure ourselves so that we can address things more nimbly. We can really be in, out in front of things and look to folks like those that are here uh, to make sure that we're, we're on the cutting edge of it. Yeah, so historically at Collier's, uh, we've done a really good job of, of building partnerships especially with early stage companies. Uh, we actually have over 100 different partnerships, formal partnerships with CRE tech companies uh, and, da and data companies as well, uh, which we're really proud of. And some of them are at a national level, some of them are at a local level. Um, but I think that gives us a view of what's happening and things that are working. We try to scale as quickly as possible. Um, the other way is that we're investing in uh, our internal team. So we recently took the IT team uh, and split it in, in half. And basically, uh, the infrastructure keep the lights on team is now functioning as a team. And then we've created a innovation team, R&D team, uh, that's focused completely on uh, what are we delivering to, what are we arming our brokers with, what kind of technologies internally that we can build, uh, what technologies can we provide to service our customers better, even directly to our customers. Uh, and I think that investment is uh, accelerating 
our commitment to driving technology within the firm. Uh, and it's great because I was with the entire leadership team yesterday, and everyone is on board. Everyone is very supportive. Uh, and so we're really excited about the things that we're doing. That's awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a broad consensus that there's, as you mentioned, foundational or intern looking in uh, function. And then there's a group in each of the companies that is more opportunistic, looking externally and scanning the environment. That seems right. That's, right. Yeah. That's fantastic. Does that seem like that was the case about 10 years ago, maybe? Uh, I mean, definitely not for us. We were very focused inwardly on technology and process and then we try to address client needs as they arose or yeah. get as best we could in front of them. Um, but for us, we came to the same conclusion and, and a little over a year ago, we launched this independent group, JLL Spark, that sits outside of our businesses, reports directly to the, to the CEO, and then about a week ago announced that we launched a $100 million fund that they're going to manage independently of those existing businesses that, that we have to keep running. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started a CRE tech company five years ago, yes, and I promise you, things have changed <laughs> a lot. The first few years were tough. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, there is, in the last even 12 months, yep. there's been a big shift, especially with the big brokerage firms, of uh, accepting what's new, you know, always looking for opportunities. Um, and that's exciting for a lot of the, obviously, the companies here today and people here today that are trying to launch their own startup or in the early stages of trying to get some traction, uh, I think we're all a lot more open to having that conversation and figuring out how a partnership would work. I think, I think two, two, two things. One, one is that there wasn't the technology that, that we could employ 10 years ago. And then two, the workforce has changed dramatically. So if you take a look at you know, Collier's or JLL or CBRR workforce, it looks dramatically different today than it was, like every other firm, it looks dramatically different than it was 10 years ago. So I think the application, the, the education, the ability to, to put it to use is quite a bit more um, you know, on steroids. Definitely. Yeah, I, th I think the experience has been generally similar on the CBRE side as well, right? Um, I'd say the firm has been historically quite focused on technology as well, but in a measured sort of a way, right? So because the velocity of technology startups was much lesser 10 years ago, and the unit cost was a lot higher um, as a barrier of entry, right, for, for companies that to, to come into the space as a, as a startup, you had an ability to take a look at things in depth, but then be, be uh, you know, it, it had to be a significantly different value proposition than sort of the average to, uh, to, to make it within CBRE, you know. Um, uh, and so people now, fast forward 10 years, the unit costs have gone down significantly. And I'd say that, you know, the impetus from the client side has been significantly different, right? So like now, uh, the workforce is changing, the expectations for what residential, I mean, uh, what, what real estate means to people is changing and so forth. So combine the two things, you know, the velocity significantly increased. And I think one of the big things we've seen at CBRE in terms of the change is to move from actually really well-run internal labs type functions to miniature versions of those in all various lines of businesses so that, you know, we can really not just at corporate level but in our day-to-day -day businesses um, embrace technology. And uh, you, you couldn't have given me a better lead into the next question. <laughs> so this is a two-part question. Uh, and I think general consensus, and I, I would welcome a disagreement here. You guys think we are guys and gals, and kind of politically correct. Uh, guys and gals, are we uh, uh, innovative industry as commercial real estate or lagging industry? Yeah, that's pretty much always yeah. that's, that's That's why we started this event. Um, and so as a lagging industry, the question is, how do we increase adoption? Uh, and so what, are, what is your firm doing to increase adoption? And then the second question is, for firms that are here, what can they be doing or thinking about in order to help ensure that they're getting in front of the right people and providing the best information and ulti ult ultimately the most relevant information and making the best use of your professional's time? Uh, I'll go. Uh, so I, I think that the adoption side, actually, we're far more advanced than I think we give ourselves credit for. Um, I, I think internally, at least. I think that if you take a look at just the brokerage ranks, so, which is just one portion of our collective businesses, but one that I think gets a lot of uh, air time to talk about, the reality is uh, those individuals who are in that service line have adopted technology, and they have for years and years and years and years, and they've self-financed a lot of that. So I, I think that, 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 honestly, the sales process uh, has been digitized for quite some time. Um, it's, it could be far more, 
but it has been for, for some time. The client-facing technology, the stuff that's a bit more sexy, a bit more fun, um, that is just relatively new, right? It's been five years since you've really been able to utilize mapping in a way that's, that's educational, not just for a client, but internally to really showcase what happens within a city. So I, I think that, um, that the, the partnership model, which I think we all have, the investment model, which, which some of us have, um, allows more of our fee earners, allows more of our people to kind of utilize what's, again, a little bit more client-facing, but I wouldn't sell us too short on our adoption. I hear you. So uh, I do think there are, there are a lot of institutional hurdles to broad adoption in our industry, and it comes in all sorts of forms. We were talking about earlier that there are big investors who control a lot of properties who are not going to be digitized and probably won't through their lifetimes, right? So there are parts of it that we'll, 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 we'll eat. Can I interrupt? So yes. we were in the back and we were talking about this scenario. When you say are not digitalized, what does that mean in some select instances? Well, well in this instance in particular, this one very large investor does not have a computer. This happens. So this literally, if you want to send an email to this person, you have to send it to someone at the front desk. They print it out and hand it to him, and he reads it on paper. And yeah, the reason I, 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 so I call that out is because I think a lot of um, millennials or younger, they, they just can't, it's hard to process this. It's hard but this to is process a reality that. in the industry, and uh, this is something we need to consider. That's Sorry, right. go on. Yeah, so, so there are some hurdles. And then uh, also from an adoption standpoint, I think the trick for, for all of us is to be thoughtful about who we're asking to adopt what. Um, and Andrew's examples of brokers who can be very entrepreneurial and forward looking, really eager to adopt sales tools, right? So mapping's a great one. They can take it and they show you, okay, here's where your buildings are, here's where you could go. Um, but how do we make sure that what they're doing then turns into a real value creation for you as the client, right? Beyond just a sales tool. So I think we, we have to be, and we're all going through these kind of growing pains as we go through this, who are we asking to adopt what so that we can ensure that we can then pull all the data from the systems that we're going to build and then it turns into value creation for you. Yeah, I, asking to adopt, I think that's a good way of saying asking to adopt. Uh, the organizational structure for all of our firms, it's very entrepreneurial, the brokers are, uh, and so it's hard to force anything. We truly have to ask them and so I think the only way that we get adoption is if you can create value. Um, for, for, for the user. And I, I think everyone here would be very surprised where if you get one broker or one team using something and they're getting value out of it, how quickly that goes up to like my team or senior leadership. Um, and we've seen that, I mean that's my story with Gauliers is that we had one person in the organization say yes, one person. Uh, and they were a big champion and they connected us and the next thing you know we became a national partner of theirs. Uh, and so I, I, I know it's a struggle to work through all the complications of this massive organization and these um, you know, dozens if not over a hundred decision makers that you feel like you have to talk to and convince in order to make it happen. Uh, but I would start at the lower level and try to get in with the individual broker, individual team uh, and try to use that as a white paper to get in front of senior leadership. And then in addition to that, I think you do need to understand what our you know, corporate IT, corporate technology innovation plan is and how you fit into that. Uh, I think everyone here wants to get out of these silos, whether it be technologies or data or whatever it is. Um, and if you are creating a silo instead of being part of the bigger picture, it's going to be very difficult. Um, and you're probably just going to be selling to those individuals. So it's really good to think about how do I fit, how does my company, how does my technology fit into the broader picture? Uh, and those are the ones that end up gaining a much bigger, larger uh, partnership with, with us at least. We, we talked about brokerage, but I'll tell you some of the more, um, I, I think on the asset services side, um, I think that's probably been amongst, to talk about adoption. Um, has been the quickest to adopt, right? So predictive maintenance and things that are, that are going on in that arena, all of us are using, uh, and we're, weren't even discussing that four years ago, yeah. really. And our, our valuation team is 100%. incredibly mm -hmm. innovative and uh, engaged, and uh, so it just depends on the business line. Uh, certain ones are, you know, it's just different. So anything that can be automated is going to be quicker. 
right? Because valuation is the exact same thing. So, so through a relationship we have with, with uh, Metaprop, we have a, um, an app called Bowery, which is, in essence um, tries to automate those appraisals that are uh, less complicated um, and, and do it paperless. And uh, I think we're all working on things like that. But uh, it's amazing what the power of doing that within, uh, within the palm of your hand within four hours, being able to turn that around. And uh, we talked, or we, I was listening to just a few minutes ago, what that would have taken, you know, uh, you know, three years ago even. Would have been weeks, two weeks. And I think in many ways, you know, for all of us here and all of our firms, uh, there's been a significant tailwind that's been accelerating commercial real estate relevance and significance and so forth as an industry. The entire industry has lifted over the last several decades just because of the job specialization, you know, versus a lot of in-house, you know, things like asset management performance and, you know, managing your portfolios yourself, not outsourcing and so forth. So, so I think some of that success has also been a bit of a barrier, actually, to adoption of new technologies and new things because you're creating value for our, your shareholders and for the clients, and so if it's not broke, don't fix this sort of a thing. And then I think uh, one of the things that uh, for CBRE that's really critical is that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be success, of course, in the next 10 years or 20 years and so forth. And so you really want to have an identification of what are the must-haves from an evolution standpoint that we have to move to, right? So that for us is all sort of codified in a global strategy that says these are the things that we absolutely have to force adoption on within the organization, even if there's areas that doesn't want to evolve, let's say. And then there are many, many other ways they add value. In general, I think somebody mentioned in the audience we're quite a few years behind as a, as a sector. Um, and I think those things for CBRE tend to be uh, almost, we kind of measure from a, like a crowdsourcing st standpoint, not to force on anybody, I think Jake, you were mentioning earlier, to ask for adoption and then seeing how that picks up, and that's kind of a measure of whether or not that ultimate technology or that tool is going to be uh, useful for us at a broader scale, in which case we engage in a different way, or for our clients. So, so things that are, which is many more in number, that are not absolutely the core uh, mission critical things that, that has to evolve, we, we sort of uh, test and learn as we go, and then the other things are sort of corporate driven with full buy-in from the board and from a CEO and C-suite. I love that there's corporate strategy around the technology vision. It probably expedites the process in a way that you just couldn't do before. Yeah. Um, so how do you think about uh, the build versus buy? So in many cases, you've incubated technologies internally. We hear about these fantastic acquisitions within the CRE space, which have contributed to the business in innovative ways. Um, but you've done a lot with your own data. Um, how do you go through that decision process is it something you have formulated, or is it case by case? I, th I think for CBRE, it's, it's, it's a, well, it's case by case in the sense of what the topic matter is at hand, right? But whether or not it's a build or a buy or a license, I think it's really a, a factor of a number of things. So th for us, it's about time to market is one of the big things. It's internal capability, whether we have it or don't, or how long it will take to develop a such a thing. I think the unit costs or the, the, the holding costs you know, uh, may be different. Uh, depending on whether it's a build or buy and so forth, right? And the risk level that comes along with it. So it's a little bit of an equation, uh, if you will. And, and, and then I think for, for many of our areas, many of our service areas, we generally have a good sense of whether things are likely to be, you know, build or buy. Uh, we've got quite a few uh, in-house uh, software teams as well, so we do build a fair bit. Uh, but things that are buy are pretty clear. Um, they're not so much on a fence. And then we use our in-house teams plus really great partners in Fifth Wall and others uh, to go execute externally. Cool. Yeah. I mean, we, we go through a pretty quick process to, to make a determination. Our, our strategy on this is we've got four pieces to it. It's buy, build, integrate, and prove. So we either are, we look at a problem or we look at an opportunity and we say we're either going to buy or build, then we're going to integrate and improve so that it kind of have that virtuous cycle of continuing to improve products and then you go back through and do we buy, build, integrate something new and improve. So we're, we're constantly doing it. We're trying our best to do it quickly. Um, so that, that's how we look at it. We're not too different in the sense that, that we have a similar thought process uh, as, as both of you have explained. We clearly have uh, a, a, a pretty direct, however, uh, thought process on buy versus build in the sense of partnership. 
So where, where we build is primarily in a couple different categories. We have uh, a couple thousand people in St. Louis who are, um, who are working in a thing called uh, PSC that we have, which is really kind of solutioning for large clients. And there's a lot of software engineers who are doing things there. They're helping us uh, take best practices towards uh, local markets. But um, it, when, we, when, we, when we partner with, with, with the Metaprops of the world, or the fifth walls of the world, um, it's really because we don't foresee us uh, as someone who is an expert in that field. So the, so, so the build is really on things that I think is a bit more internal focused. Got it. Uh, yeah, we, we honestly try to buy first and okay. build second. Uh, we have a very talented team internally that can build uh, you know, great products for our, for our, our clients as well as our, our brokers. But at the end of the day, we operate like a startup within a much larger organization. We have limited resources. We have limited budget, limited time. And so if it's things that we feel like aren't out in the market that we need, uh, then we have to build. But if there are things that are in the market, uh, we are not delusional in thinking that a company with $10 million for the funding that's already built something and going to be focused on that 100% for the next decade that we're going to be able to do as one of many projects that we're working on. Um, I actually really uh, am excited about, and I've actually talked to a few companies here that are very early stage that we can partner with, uh, drive some of what the product is going to look like over the next 12 months, be an early adopter, uh, but there's some advantages to that. And, uh, and there are a lot of these companies that we want to build because we feel like they're not out there. And I'm convincing you know, leadership to say, hey, now let's go partner with someone who's going to be 100% focused, drive some of their uh, development, and, and, uh, and help. You know, it's a win-win for both sides. And I, so I think we're unusual in that way. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I've been on the other side of the table. Uh, but I feel like there's a lot more willingness to work with earlier stage companies at Collier's, and that's a little bit of our culture and entrepreneurial spirit. Um, cool. So I, that's, that's what drives me. I actually think there's going to, we'll see over the next two to five years probably a little separation in our industry, and, and not for better or worse, but you'll have the group of, of companies who have the breadth to be able to access data across businesses and across geographies that also have the ability to invest so they can buy and build and do whatever they want to. Then you're going to have the companies who can be more nimble and can access, like Jake said, you could go buy something or like you mentioned earlier, the example of someone built something specifically for you. So those companies that can be nimble. And if you're caught in the middle, it's going to be, I think, a little challenging to figure out, like, are we going to go invest and build our own platforms? Or are we going to try to go uh, find the partners or the, the smaller companies that we can work with to d then deliver meaningful value to users? And then for us, because we're sitting up in, in the, that first category, I think we're going to constantly have to fight that challenge of the David versus Goliath metaphor, which is, you know, Goliath comes out and he's got his armor on and he's got his big sword. He was prepared for the wrong battle and just didn't see, didn't see the fight coming, right? So we're going to have to constantly challenge ourselves to make sure we're staying ahead of, ahead of the curve that way. That's great. That's great. So um, one last question, then we'll open up for a couple of questions from the audience. Jake, you were kind of leading us in this direction, which okay. is great. Which is, so what are you excited about? What areas, what products, what... You don't have to talk about specific products, but what are sectors or segments of the CRE tech landscape that are of particular interest? And you can give a caveat that this is interest to you versus your firm. But yeah, uh, yeah. What, what what are things that my you firm really is want interested in building a platform that we can you know connect a lot of the dots as far as the process, digitize the process, improve our sales efforts. Uh, and that's what we're focused on at Collier's. What excites me, uh, that excites me. <laughs> that's my job. I'm excited about it. <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, but if you're talking about 5, 10, 20 years into the future, things that we are you know, monitoring, I mean, the blockchain is very interesting to me. Um, I don't know, the poll out here, I think it was half and half. Uh, but yeah, what those guys were talking about, I'm very interested in how that's going to change. And then also, uh, Something that's not a CRE tech company, but will probably have the biggest impact on our industry is autonomous vehicles. And I, I mentioned that in a, in a recent article. It, it really is going to change the way that we live and work. And I mean, simple things like all these parking decks and parking lots, that's real estate, this will go away. Uh, how important is it to be near public transportation for your office in certain cities? Like, that might go away. 
uh, are people willing to move further out, or is it more because they're, you know, the early adopters of that are living within the cities? Like, how does that transition, and then what does that do for, uh, yeah, uh, office space and where we live and apartments and all that uh, distribution? I mean, the cost. I used to be a commercial real estate broker focused on industrial, and my team was it's, it was a logistics service. I mean, that's what we were. Uh, that changes a lot because the costs completely get flipped on their on their head. So, I think that technology is by far the most interesting to me because I think it will have the biggest impact over the next five, ten, twenty years on our industry. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be excited about, right? That's why this is a standing room only audience, um, not because of the four or five of us, but <laughs> they're you know, all here just, for you. No, actually. definitely not. <laughs> um, so the foundational stuff, as Jake mentioned, yes, we're all excited about it. We kind of know where we're headed there for the most part. Um, I think a second piece, it's kind of similar to the autonomous vehicles, is just the personalization of real estate. So how the individual user experiences real estate and then how we deliver a product, we collectively deliver a product that addresses that, that individual human's needs. But then also, I mean, it's just in the last couple of weeks, like things that I never would have even thought as part of our process that could or should be digitized. I mean, there's, you know, certificates of insurance or, you know, at some point somebody's going to figure out window washing. There's all these big businesses that play a role and a small role in our industry that uh, it'll be interesting to see which of those catch, you know, catch wind a little bit and then grab onto an adjacent business and just because of the units or interface or the way they crowdsource information. Um, it'll be really fun to, to watch some of those uh, catch hold. Yeah, it, uh, I, I, would, I would echo quite a bit of that. Um, I think AV is absolutely going to be the, the disruptor, if, you, if I hate the term, but I, but I think it really will be. Um, I think what's really interesting for me personally right now is, is, is that um, cities are finally uh, progressing in their thought, and, um, and this city has done some of that. Uh, I think Los Angeles is doing a great deal of that of recent. Um, we do a lot of work with the city of Los Angeles on, on, their, on their own real estate portfolio, how to utilize it. And virtually every single solution uh, that is being thought about has some form of technology focused on it. So AV being a big component of it, right? V literally zero parking space is being uh, thought of in, mu in much of their portfolio. It's just a fascinating time because I think for the first time you're seeing kind of urban planning hit technology, hit kind of the next thought and what's around the corner. I think for me personally, I mean, I'm really excited about all the stuff you guys just mentioned. That's because it hits us, all of us, directly. We see it in our day and day, right? You know, our streets change and the like. But I think one other thing, maybe in addition to the, the, the areas you guys just mentioned, is something that's a little bit less, um, you know, visible directly, but is underlying so many different things, which is machine learning. The, the, the ability to uh, train uh, bots and engines to be able to deliver services in ways that were previously not envisioned, I think will be really uh, uh, game changing. I think mostly, I would say, without saying one area or another, to me, the fact that we're actually 20 years behind financial services and many other industries, just think about what can happen in 20 years, right? And how much life has changed for all of us as consumers of financial services and stuff. That's just an example industry over the last 20 years. So I think all the stuff we mentioned is interesting. I think there'll be another five new things probably, you know, two years from now. Okay. Right. Cool. Yeah. It'll be a good event next year. <laughs>